Good afternoon, everyone. I have a lot at the top, so just bear with me as I get through this. Um, I think we're all closely following the reports of an attack on the American University of Afghanistan. We condemn this attack in the strongest possible terms. An attack on a university is an attack on the future of Afghanistan. Our embassy in Kabul, as well as our NATO counterparts at the Resolute Support Mission, are closely monitoring the situation, as we are. We understand the situation is ongoing. We do understand there are a small number of Resolute Support Advisors who are assisting their Afghan counterparts as Afghan forces are responding as the situation develops. These advisors are not taking a combat role, but advising Afghan counterparts. We are in the process of accounting for all chief of mission personnel and working to locate and assist any U.S. citizens affected by these attacks. The U.S. Embassy in Kabul did issue a security message warning U.S. citizens of the attack and advising them to avoid the area until further notice. Our travel warning for Afghanistan <coughs> warns U.S. citizens against travel to Afghanistan because of the continued instability and threats by terror attacks against U.S. citizens. We don't have any additional information at this time. However, we will continue to update you as we can. On the two earthquakes that happened um, today, we express our deepest condolences to all those affected by the earthquake that struck central Italy. Today, Secretary Kerry spoke to the Italian Foreign Minister and made clear the American people stand with the Italians in this difficult time. He offered any U.S. assistance Italy may require and pledged to stay in close contact as search, rescue, and recovery efforts continue. We're also aware and have seen the reports of the earthquake that struck north central Burma today. We offer our deepest condolences as well to the families who lost their loved ones. Again, we still are gathering information <coughs> on the event and we're staying in close contact with the government of Burma and humanitarian partners in the country to monitor the situation. The United States stands ready to provide assistance. Uh, yes, sir. Both of those. Are you aware, have they, either of the governments uh, concerned at made any requests for assistance? At this stage, we have no requests. We have offered in both. Um, moving on to the DPRK. The United States strongly condemns North Korea's latest submarine launch ballistic missile launch. We call on the DPRK to refrain from actions and rhetoric that further raise tensions in the region and focus instead on taking concrete steps towards fulfilling its commitments and international obligations. The U.S. commitment to the defense of our allies, including the Republic of Korea and Japan in the face of these threats, remains ironclad. We remain prepared to defend ourselves and our allies. This launch is the latest in an accelerating campaign of missile tests which violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions explicitly prohibiting North Korea's launches using ballistic missile technology and pose threats to civil aviation and maritime commerce in the region. These actions only serve to increase the international community's resolve to counter the DPRK's <laughs> prohibited activities, including through implementing existing UN Security Council resolutions. North Korea's continued development of its UN prescribed nuclear and ballistic missile programs threatens the United States, our allies, Japan and the Republic of Korea, and our partners in the region. We continue to assess the situation in close coordination with our regional allies and partners. We will raise our concerns at the UN and in other fora to bolster international resolve to hold the DPRK accountable for its provocative actions. And finally, and thank you for your patience, um, travel notes. As you know, Secretary Kerry is in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia today and tomorrow to discuss the situation in Yemen. As we have noted before, the United States remains deeply concerned by the deteriorating situation in Yemen and is committed to working with the Yemenis and the rest of the international community to restore peace and stability. We strongly support the UN Special Envoy's efforts as he works tirelessly on all sides of this conflict. The United States, along with the international community, are ready to assist and will continue to engage until peace is restored in Yemen. Secretary Kerry will travel to Geneva, Switzerland from August 25th to August 27th, where his meetings will include Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov and UAE National Security Advisor Sheikh Tamun bin Zayed bin Nayan to discuss issues including Syria and Libya. 
And finally, Secretary Kerry will travel to Dhaka, Bangladesh on August 29th to highlight the longstanding and broad U.S.-Bangladesh relationship. Secretary Kerry will meet with government officials to discuss our growing cooperation on global issues. He'll focus on strengthening our longstanding bilateral partnership on democracy, development, security, and human rights. On August 29th through 31st, Secretary Kerry will then travel to New Delhi, India, for meetings with senior Indian officials. On August 30th, Secretary and U.S. Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker will co-chair the second U.S.-India Strategic and Commercial Dialogue. Secretaries Kerry and Pritzker will be joined by their respective Indian co-hosts, the Minister of External Affairs and the Minister of State and Commerce, uh, Minister of State for Commerce and in Industry, along with members of the U.S. delegation and their Indian counterparts. I note the S and CD is the signature mechanism for advancing the United States and India's shared priorities of generating sustainable economic growth creating jobs, improving the business and investment climate, enhancing livelihoods, and sustaining the rule-based global sort of. Thanks for your patience. And with that, um, Yeah, before we get on to other things, I just want to go back to the, Af the yep. attack in, in Kabul. When you said you didn't have any, <clears throat> excuse me, when you said you didn't have any other information, does that mean that you're not aware of any Americans who were So we're still, uh, we're still working to locate and assist any U.S. citizens impacted by the attacks. Do you know, uh, roughly how, do, do you have, do you know at all, like how many? Um, I don't. As you know, as we don't require U.S. citizens to register overseas, you know, in something like this, we would always encourage people to register with the okay. STEP program, but no. But as far as you know, <clears throat> there was no one from the embassy or no official American. We're still doing chief of mission accountability. Oh, so right any exactly. Americans being at the university, either at official this stage, or we're we're still working to account for all official as well as private Americans in Kabul. No, we would we we would not have a number like that to share. Yeah. Sorry. Is it, uh, meetings in Saudi Arabia. Is he Are we done with Afghanistan? I'm sorry, Michelle. I just want to close this one out because it is a big news story. Are we okay on that? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. A senior U.S. official has said that uh, the Secretary will present proposals on ending uh, uh, Yemen's conflict uh, and resuming peace talks. Okay, can you elaborate on that? What kind of proposals? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get ahead of the meetings on this. You know, as I said at the top, we remain committed to a peaceful, sustainable solution in Yemen. Uh, we strongly support the UN Special Envoy's work. Um, we'll let those meetings happen, and if I have more of a readout, I'll certainly offer that, Michelle. And what's behind the participation of uh, UK uh, Foreign Minister in these meetings tomorrow? So I'm not going to confirm the participation on that. What I would say is what I said, which is the international community is very seized with us. You know, we're looking broadly at our international partners um, to move forward on a peace process in Yemen. Last week, uh, yep. on the same topic, uh, the United States withdrew its advisors that were helping and assisting the Arab coalition in bombing Yemen and so on. So uh, is that a, a signal, would you consider that to be a strong signal that the United States is going to push hard for a peaceful resolution and in the very near future? Well, I think you have two questions on that. You know, of course, the United States will always push hard on a peaceful resolution. Let's be very clear on that. In terms of the advisors, this is a Department of Defense issue, and I'm going to let them speak to their personal movements. Because, you know, the, there, was, there is a great deal of – there are many accusations, let's put it this way, that you guys are looking the other way while, you know, you, the coalition the, that is led by Saudi Arabia was targeting hospitals. Yeah, hospitals I would, I would so dispute on. that. You know, you certainly not only have we spoken from this podium about our concerns, but we've engaged, as we've noted, both uh, privately and publicly on that. Um, our commitment to a peaceful resolution in Yemen is, is very strong. Do we have more on Yemen? Okay. Do we, are we okay to move to Turkey? Syria, I, I would just – Yeah. In Ankara, Joe Biden said Kurdish forces must move back across the Euphrates River. He says they cannot, will not, under any circumstances get uh, American support if they do not keep that commitment, uh, end quote. I, I want to ask you about the geography of what Joe Biden uh, meant there. Uh, I'm looking at the, at the map here, and moving back across the Euphrates River would mean moving to the Kobani side. And the city of Mom Beach, which uh, Kurdish fighters helped liberate from ISIL, is on the side of the river, river mm -hmm. which Joe Biden wants the Kurdish fighters to leave. 
With that, I want to ask, does the U.S. call on Kurdish fighters to leave Mom Beach as well? Okay. So what I would say is, is the Vice President's remarks were very clear on that. What we have always said, as um, we gain ground and, and the, the, the operations on the ground gain ground against Daesh, is that we want local forces, local forces to continue for stabilization in that area. And, and we've made that very clear. You know, we continue to work with our partners in the Syrian Democratic Forces as they complete these operations. Um, the SDF is continuing to work on stabilizing areas that are reclaimed from ISIL so populations can safely re uh, return. You know, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the Kurdish population, we do have commitments, as we've spoken to before, from Kurdish leadership that those forces who stabilize the area will mirror the local populations. Um, we believe that that's the best solution for a long-term sustainable peace. Uh, the local population who stays and rebuilds that area and, and restores local control when that's stabilized. Kurdish forces are part of Hold on, can we, can we finish, yeah. Lori? Thank they you. are part of the local, local forces there, but uh, Joe Biden, uh, Vice President Joe Biden calling on Kurdish fighters to uh, move across the river, does that also include a call on Kurdish fighters to leave the city of Mom Beach, which, which is on the side of the, on the other side of the so, river? So I'm, I'm not going to parse the Vice President's word. What we would say is that we believe that local forces need to be in control of the, of the areas that have been liberated by Daesh. Lori, you had a question. What, what will happen if the YPG does not withdraw from west of the Euphrates River and move back east, as what the Vice President said they had to do today. What do you expect might well, happen? You're asking me a hypothetical. The Kurdish commanders have made commitments. We expect them to live up to those commitments. But, but, Go I'm ahead. It was, it was sure. actually a very specific question. Does yeah. the U.S. call on Kurdish fighters to leave the city of Mom Beach, which they helped liberate from ISIL recently? So Kurdish commanders have made commitments that they will turn over areas to local populations as they have been so tremendously su successful in liberating those areas from Daesh. We expect them to live up to those commitments. I'm not going to get into this town or this village. You know, the Vice President spoke to it today, and, and I believe his comments were there. Sayed. Yeah, yeah but, but you know, this town and this village is, is exactly the problem because you have your partners, the Kurds and mm -hmm. the Turks, on opposite sides uh, in many of these areas. So how do you know when to aid your partner and when, when to withhold whatever aid that you might give that partner? Yeah. I mean, this is a complex situation. I think you're exactly right, and this is what we're getting to. We continue to engage directly with, you know, the, the local forces on the ground as well as our partners, the Turks, as we work through this. You know, the commitment, as we talked about with Lori, that the local um, – populations would be in control of those areas as they're liberated from Daesh. You know, the Kurdish commanders have made that commitment. Now, I agree the Kurdish forces are, are poised to control the whole of Hasaka, which is the whole mm -hmm. region uh, uh, of Hasaka. Now, that may give incentive to Turkey, for instance, to basically realign itself with Assad. Are you concerned about that? Is this something? You know, I, again, I don't want to get into to operational details. You guys, you guys know that there's another department across the river that can speak very clearly to that. What I will say, though, is that we do remain engaged. We are having very active conversations with our partners. Uh, this is something I think everyone is seized with. Are we doing Turks? No, no. Yes. Okay, hold on. Okay. And more broadly on policy. Okay, well, hold on. Are, are we doing Turkey Syria or are we doing plain Turkey? Okay, well, let's clean this up and then I'll go back to you, okay? Thank Sorry. you. The, the Turkish Prime Minister said that the United States must reassess its view of the YPG. As far as you understand, does Vice President Biden's statement that the YPG must withdraw east of the to the east of the Euphrates, does it address the concern that the Turkish Prime Minister expressed? Our, our view on the YPG hasn't changed. Okay. The, the U.S. supports Turkey's operations in Syria, even though the Turkish President says he's going to go after not only ISIL, but also Kurdish fighters in Syria, the very Kurdish fighters whom the U.S. has supported. What would you say to those Kurds in Syria who believe they're being abandoned by the U.S.? 
Okay. Well, I would dispute views that they be all, uh, that they're being abandoned. We have been very clear on on our support. These have been tremendous fighters against our common enemy, which mm -hmm. is Stash. On this, as I've said, we remain in close contact with both the Turks as well as uh, local Kurdish commanders on this. Um, it's a complex issue. It's a fast-moving issue. Um, I'm not going to be able to speak to specific operational details on this. Um, but we have said, and we've long said, that we view that these are very capable fighters, and we all need to focus instead on, um, you know, the, this infighting on the common enemy, which is staff. Just one, one of last Of course, one, one last reading, one. reading the news today, and, and I read this. Captain Abdel Salam Abdel Razak, spokesman for the Nur al-Din al-Zinki rebel group, tells the Associated Press that the fighters on Wednesday were Kami Jarablus for pockets of ICE, uh, IS militants, end quote. This is the same group, the members of which beheaded an 11-year-old boy a month ago. And I want to ask, does the U.S. support this group's taking over Jarablus? We've spoken about this at length on, on that particular group, um, the allegations of the beheading, the support or, or non-support of the United States for that group. You know, what we are committed to um, is taking the fight to Daesh. I'm not going to speak to that specific group or, or who's involved in the ground. I just don't have that level of operational details. Last one, Laurie, and then Matt, I'll come Let to you. Let me rephrase my question more generally. Do you think that Vice President Biden's visit to Turkey has resolved the dispute that used to exist between Ankara and Washington over the YPG? I think that we remain in contact with our friends and allies, the Turks, on a range of issues. You know, certainly the Vice President's visit um, is a huge nod to the importance that we view uh, that Turkey has not only as a, an ally within NATO, our bilateral ties, but the importance of, of Turkey in the fight against Daesh. Mm -hmm. Matt? Okay. I'm sorry, can I go to Matt then and then I'll come back to you, Michelle. Michelle? Okay, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, how can you balance your support to Turkey in fighting ISIS and YPG in Syria and supporting YPG in fighting ISIS in Syria? What we've, what we've said, which is what I said earlier, is we continue to engage in these conversations so we have a common understanding on who the real threat is, who the real enemy is, and that, that's that. they are fighting each other on that And we continue to have those conversations mm -hmm. with them to refocus that. Matt? Uh, I would just like to know what the point of the Secretary's meeting, uh, upcoming meeting in Geneva with Foreign Minister Lavrov as they relate to Syria, what, 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 the, point of the, what the point of it is. So, as we've spoken, you know, earlier this week, we continue to have discussions um, at a technical level with the Russians, you know, on, the, on our, our pronged approach, which is reestablishment of a nationwide sustainable cessation of hostilities to um, bring in humanitarian aid. We're very focused on that right now to create the space for a political transition. You know, as we have meetings, and I don't want to get ahead of them too much, you know, we're very focused on how we can make that for you. Yeah, I, I'm not asking you to get ahead of them, <clears throat> get ahead of the meeting. I'm just wondering what, you know, is this, are, are you expecting there to be any kind of resolution to the issues that you have just mentioned, or at least on an approach to the issues that you, you've mentioned, or is this just going to be another kind of uh, see where we are? I think we're very of, pragmatic. Uh, on this, you know, I think that. Well, well that's that, good, but what does that mean? I, I think that we don't want to, we want to be um, very measured in our expectations as we go forward into this meeting, um, but we believe the meeting's worth having. Uh, yeah, well, obviously, you believe it's worth having because you're, you're having it, but the question is whether it actually results in anything. Well, and I understand that you want to set expectations low because, frankly, that's where they should be considering what's happened at all the previous meetings. But, when you talk about restoration of a nationwide uh, cessation of hostilities, is there not a focus primarily on the situation around Aleppo? Certainly Aleppo is a huge priority. The access for humanitarian aid is a huge priority. Um, we have a laundry list of and, issues. Okay, so can you be more specific? You know, about the I, list? that what I would say is exactly what we've said. The three prongs, you mentioned Aleppo, absolutely a priority going in. I can't get ahead of, of where we are. Okay. In I'm not asking you to get ahead of it. But, I mean, are you looking to uh, to get an agreement on the kind of stepped-up 
cooperation slash coordination with the Russians uh, in Syria that people have talked about for you know more than a month. Yeah, I can't. I can't get ahead of it. We are. So that's we not are, going to be discussed at all. I it. I would say that the path forward in Syria will absolutely be discussed. This, as well as Ukraine, will be part of the focus of these meetings. Focus very specifically on what I said, as well as Aleppo. Um, let's see where that goes. Are, are you continuing to make headway, uh, as uh, Mark Turner said yesterday? I think we continue to engage. Um, you know, I think that we. Um, have announced the meeting. We will have this meeting. We will um, go into it with, uh, despite Matt not liking the word pragmatic, a very pragmatic <laughs> mindset. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll stand corrected on that. But that none of this good. addresses my question, no. which is yesterday you said you were making headway. Is that still the case today? Are you still making headway? I think the fact that we've scheduled a meeting is, is a good sign. And, and we'll see what happens at the meeting. Ye yesterday you said we're not quite there. He said we're not quite there yet. That implies that you are on the brink of I, I wouldn't characterize it as the brink, but what I would say is we have a ways to go. So do you go from yesterday, we're not quite there yet, to today, we've got a ways to go? Well, it depends on how long your road is, Arshana. <laughs> well, clearly you're, 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 you're five, five, you're five and a half yeah. year well, old it is. road. And, and, and you know what, to be to honest, Matt, we haven't lost sight of that. You know, this is where we think we're going. We're going to sit down. We're going to have a very real conversation. We're going into it with our eyes open. Um, nobody's disputing that yeah. you're going to have a meeting, that you're going to sit down, that your eyes will be open and not closed. Uh, during the meeting. The question, though, is is the signaling that you're making about the meeting, which is very perplexing. Yesterday, it's we're not quite there yet, and today, it's we've got a ways to go. Where, where are you? Yeah, are you close I, or not? Um, I would not characterize it as saying, I would say that we still have um, issues that need to be resolved. Um, however, we are meeting. We are going to put, you know, Secretary Kerry and the Foreign Minister you know, face to face to try and resolve some of the issues that remain. I don't know where we'll be after this. I hope to have a very good readout for you. Um, you know, let's see. But but we're committed to this and we're committed to advancing it. Go ahead, Dave. Well, it's a similar question, but phrased slightly differently. Is holding the meeting a sign that your technical discussions are deadlocked and you need the big men in the room? I to wouldn't fix characterize it, it as Or is it a sign that you've made the the technical discussions are complete, and now they need to sign up. I, I, th I think you guys are, are reading, trying to read into this in a so level I that, I, that I can't provide, yeah. which is we're going to have the meeting. We believe it's worth the Secretary's time to have this meeting. He remains deeply committed to advancing this. Um, that's where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. coming out of Ru Russia, I'm sorry, on this topic, mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, from Mr. Lavrov's office. Uh, it shows that there is a huge gulf between your position and theirs. They are accusing you, basically, of uh, ever since al Nusra changed its name uh, to Fath al-Sham, whatever, you have not been bombing it, or you have not uh, participated, the United States, that is. I mean, the United States has not participated in bombing uh, al Nusra groups that have changed names. So that, if, that, if that tells us anything, it tells us that your positions are really Apart, yeah, I'm not going to yeah. characterize what, what the Russian Foreign Ministry puts out on this. You know, um, I'll, I'll just reiterate that, that we think this is the right time and the right thing to do. Steve? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Are we still on Syria? Turkey. Turkey. Okay, let's go Turkey to Turkey. Turkey. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, the Vice President uh, Joe Biden is visiting Turkey. This can be seen the most senior U.S. official visiting there since the coup in, uh, in July. So why Vice President, when they're now, do you think the relationship between U.S. and Turkey is getting more complicated and more misunderstanding uh, as for, because not only relating to Russia, Turkey, rapprochement, but also extradition of Gulen? Okay. So, so when you're asking specifically about the Vice President's visit, I'm going to refer you to the White House, but, but I, would, I would actually, you know, push back against your characterization. We say almost every day from this podium how strong we view our relationship with Turkey to be. You know, the vice president's visit there, I think, is a sign of that. In terms, though, of, of the messages he sent, his particular meetings there, it's just not appropriate for me to speak to from here. Samia says, 
rapid Russia-Turkey rapprochement casts shadow on Western security order, and Biden visits Turkey to improve ties. So, to what kind of extent do you think Biden's visit will reach America's goal or rebuild the relationship? Yeah, I would I would dispute that there's a a, a relationship that needs to be rebuilt. Our tie, our alliance through NATO with Turkey is is very strong. So you think it's a kind of rebuilt relationship? No, I just push back against that. No, the vice president's visit is a sign of how important we view Turkey as an ally and as a partner. On particulars, though, go to the White House. Related question. Oh, wait, are we staying on Turkey? Turkey of course. Uh, the vice president now is quoted uh, from a major news agency in Ankara, saying that God willing, there will be enough data and evidence to meet the criteria that Turkey sees related to the extradition of Gulen. Isn't this extradition, as far as the United States government is concerned, supposed to be an objective process? It sounds like the okay. vice president's taking sides here. Okay, well, I haven't seen the vice president's remarks saying exactly that. You know, uh, Mark spoke to this a little yesterday. I would say our legal experts are working right now with their Turkish counterparts to evaluate the material. The evidence that needs to be supplied to meet the standards for extradition under our treaty. Um, they're meeting now. They will continue to do so. Um, as we've said, Turkey has provided materials relating to Mr. Gulen. Uh, we continue to analyze those materials. Um, under our laws, extradition requests must be assessed by an independent federal court along with the evidence backing it up. Um, I spoke to this, I think, last time I briefed. It always takes time to work through an extradition request. Um, however, there should be no doubt that we will continue to work through this, you know, working with our Turkish counterparts. So just to follow up on the sure, James. Uh, and perhaps in a way that doesn't require you to speak for the White House, does Secretary Kerry pray to God that the criteria will be met for Mr. Gulen to be extradited? We will continue to follow the letter of the law um, as signed in the 1981 extradition treaty with Turkey. Um, we will continue to work with our Turkish counterparts on that. It's still the case, as Mark said yesterday, that you have determined that what the Turks have submitted is does constitute a, a, a formal Correct. extradition request, although not related to the coup. That is exactly. still the case, right? Correct. Is it not the case that once you have made such a determination that the judicial branch, that the executive branch, uh, of government is supposed to take action to prevent the subject of an extradition request from leaving? Um, that can be part of, speaking generally, again, that can be part of an extradition request. It isn't automatically part, is my understanding. Right. Well, yeah, but, but that's what the Turks have asked. Yeah, I would, I would not be able to speak to parts of that extradition request. But, Forget, uh, forget about the extradition request, but under your rules, mm -hmm. U.S. rules for dealing with extradition requests when they come in from a country that you have a treaty with, mm -hmm. is it not normally the case that the person who is the subject of the extradition request is at a minimum confined or not are so, told that they can't leave? So I, it is my understanding that that can be part of an extradition request brought forward I'm not aware that any determination on that has been um, uh, been made. So it's not it's not. It's standard my understanding it's not procedure. standard. It could be. It could be. What do you mean by part of that can be part of an extradition? So, so for, do they have, do, does the country seeking the extradition have to specifically? Request it's that? my understanding, okay. and um, I will say I'm not a lawyer, much yeah. to my father's chagrin, um, that it could be part. Okay. Can we stay on Turkey? Uh, go ahead. We'll go to Ilham, then we'll go to you, to John. Thank you. Just two quick questions. One of that, as we all know, there has been a, a very high uh, anti-American uh, environment in Turkey. Uh, do you expect this uh, rhetoric from Ankara to change after Vice President visit? You know, we've spoken about this quite a lot. Uh, we've spoken about our concerns with anti-American rhetoric. You know, our position hasn't changed. Turkey is our friend. And second final question. 
Uh, the other day, there was a schedule between the Dr. Andre Barkey and the Under Secretary Shannon. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, Mr. Barkey has been accused of being involved in the coup. Do you have any comment on this now? No, I, I would say the Under Secretary meets with a range of people. You know, Dr. Barkey is um, an expert on Turkey. You know, we appreciate the opportunity to learn as as we can from academics and think tankers on that. You know, I believe the Wilson Center spoke very clearly about the accusations against Dr. Barkey. You know, any accusation that that any U.S. official had any role in this coup is absolutely false, and we've said that publicly. Dr. Barkey's a former member of the State Department Policy Planning Staff, as you know. Yes, and he's also working for the Wilson Center right now. So you believe he's not involved as well? Yes. Okay. To Jen. NATO and the U.S. is not the only country in NATO. Major European Union countries are there. And, there is and a, Canada. And there is a brewing tension between Brussels and Ankara, as you know, uh, on different. Uh, um, the, the Turkish president is asking for the billions in the aid for the, you know, there are different subjects. But there is a big tension that's going on. Have, have you, are you aware, have you addressed that? Is the vice president, uh, talking only on behalf of the U.S. when you're mentioning NATO so many times. It's a, it's these countries which are other members of the NATO who well, are, I would who let, are under I would let, you know, individual countries speak to their bilateral ties with Turkey um, and, and what relationships or tensions um, may exist. That's, that's not for the United States to but speak to. From the Brussels, it's not usually the individual countries that are talking and where the tensions are. It's with the tension with the EU. So are okay. you in well, touch with not the members of the EU? I would let the EU speak for itself. Thanks to gender. James, nice right. to see you. Likewise. Uh, to the subject of the payments to Iran, yep. you were quoted in the Associated Press today mm -hmm. as having confirmed uh, the manner of payment uh, for the remaining $1.3 billion in interest and, in fact, the timing of that, those payments. Uh, what can you tell us? Okay. So I can confirm that the foreign claims payments made from the Judgment Fund on January 19th do represent the payment of approximately $1.3 billion in interest in connection with the Hague Tribunal settlement payment. You know, for further details, um, I will have to refer you to the Treasury Department. But we did owe you that answer. Um, and um, this was broached in yesterday's briefing uh, to some extent. but. Um, there is an obvious difference, which I think even from the podium you would be willing to concede, between the, the, the manner of payment of the $400 million and the manner of payment for the remaining interest. Uh, what accounts for that difference? Okay. Well, we do make a practice of not commenting publicly on transactions, including settlement payments, due to the confidential nature of those payments and to respect the privacy of our international partners. In terms of the payment mechanics, and I know it's unsatisfying. I am going to have to refer you to Treasury to speak to those mechanics. But you've already violated that rule uh, in commenting, for example, about the leverage you sought to exert with the manner of the first payment and the timing of it. Did you not comment publicly on that as a department? So we did talk about the juxtaposition of these payments coming in. You know, our priority in getting our unlawfully detained Americans released, as well as the head settlement. So you're correct. The, the uh, staggering of the payments such that each would be just under $100 million, that was kind of odd, was it not? I can't speak to that, James. I really can't. I'm but you're sorry. not denying that that was the case. I just don't have enough knowledge that I can actually adequately answer your question. Uh, one follow up on this. Um, sure. You uh, pointedly noted that it was approximately $1.3 billion in interest mm -hmm. that was paid out. Um, and just to go to Matt's question from yesterday, um, what about the other 13 cents, and did they actually get that or not? You know, I think that is a question for Treasury. It's wonderful that you, that you say that, but you know, when we go to Treasury and ask, they say no comment. So referring us to a, an agency that is not inclined to provide any answers is kind of uh, disingenuous, I think, for one. Secondly, what is this privacy? that foreign governments enjoy? So it's, it's actually confidentiality for international transactions. But you put it up on a website. You paid it, right? The payment from the United guys, States to the Iranians, right? I, I actually can't speak to that. I absolutely can't verify that. 
I, I believe you're referring to a document on Treasury's website. I do understand your concern. I what, just can't see what, 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 no, no, I, so It's not my concern. It's my inability to understand how it is that governments have an expectation of privacy, which is the word you use, not confidentiality. I'm sorry. Then I misspoke. It's confidential nature. Does the United States consider that this financial dispute, the 13 cents notwithstanding, is fully resolved? Yes. A uh, different subject. So hold oh, on. Wait, hold on. Let's. When you, and when you when you're speaking of the payments that are listed on the tra on that website, you're talking about the ones for nine 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 nine, and that the 13 of those, and the one for 10 point roughly four million. Correct. The four hundred million was paid into the trust fund that was that was paid out because it was Iran's money. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Okay. I'm talking about the judgment. The, when you the say judgment it, fund. You're, you're talking the judgment fund. Everything mm -hmm. on the 19th that says foreign claims was made from the judgment well, fund. Right, and that was the interest or rent. But that that means it's the thirteen payments of the nine 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 nine, and the one for the ten point three nine, right, roughly ten point four, right. It's going beyond my level of knowledge, Matt. I'm sorry, I just can't. Well, you just that. said that. So it's my understanding that, that those payment, foreign claim payments made on January 19th. Every 19th, single one of them. Yes, okay. were made from the judgment. So fund. after you get to, to with the ones with all the nines, and you yeah. get to the other one, which is 10.4, and you add that on, mm -hmm. it's actually more than 1.3 billion. Yeah, you're you're asking me to go through payments that I am unable to do so. Okay. Uh, it's a technical question. I won't just say, I, I can't understand, I'm so dumb. That you are saying about the confidential, you're respecting the confidentiality of the other nation. Of the international what, partners. What, inter, yeah, but what about the people, uh, the, that money has been paid from the U.S. taxpayers? And as a U.S. taxpayer, am I not supposed to know where the money is going, how it is going? Is that not worth giving it to the U.S. citizens. I think, you know, as, as um, you know, the President spoke um, on January 18th, as the Secretary made clear, you know, the resolution of the Hague Settlement was, in fact, in the best interest of the U.S. taxpayer in terms of the mechanics of this, what is made public, you know, I can't speak to from this podium. James. Okay. Um, somewhat related <laughs> area. Uh, I have one on uh, the Iran uh, video edit, and then one on the printed emails, if we could. Um, uh, with respect to the, uh, the editing of the video, this department has, rather perversely from this podium, sought to claim that there is no determination as to whether or not the videos that the State Department shoots and uploads to the State Department website are, in fact, federal records. I believe you are aware that the National Archives and Records Administration has now weighed in on this subject mm -hmm. uh, in, in collaboration with the State Department Office of Inspector General. Mm -hmm. And that both of those entities have now concluded that these are indeed uh, federal records, just as I have been laboring to demonstrate in this setting for some mm -hmm. time. Uh, what have you to say about that determination? We agree with NARA. Thanks for the question. The rules for how records need to be treated are set by record disposition schedules. Records can be permanent or temporary, which I think you understand Nara had, had pointed out. Um, the transcript is addressed in the disposition schedule on a permanent record. There is no disposition schedule as of right now that covers how the daily press briefing videos need to be preserved. Uh, we are working with Nara right now to create a disposition schedule for them, at which point it'll be clarified if the videos will be temporary or permanent. Um, you know, Kirby mentioned this last week that we would be consulting. NARA has come back, and we agree with him. NARA stated that uh, it reached this conclusion after a query by the Office of the Inspector General, not a query by the Department of State. Mm -hmm. uh, did the Office of Inspector General convey this finding of their own, with which NARA subsequently agreed, to the department at any point along the way? I can't talk about timing. I will say that, that um, the Office of the Legal Advisor looked into it, and, and we, uh, we agree with NARA. We'll work with them, and we will set this schedule. Right, but 
OIG is separate from OIG. Very much, absolutely, and okay. I couldn't speak for them. Okay, but I'm just asking if your department was informed by OIG that they had reached I don't know. I don't know who was informed by whom. Um, right now, we're very focused on, on setting the disposition schedule, and, and I would even back up. You know, um, Assistant Secretary Kirby has made clear, you know, there weren't rules on this. Um, there wasn't this disposition schedule. We're going to fix this. We're going to establish this. We're going to set the rules. And also, frankly, he set now the, the um, overarching guidance for public affairs that this sort of edit will never happen again. You can claim, perhaps plausibly, that there were no rules in place to prohibit mm -hmm. a, a deliberate censorship of one of these State Department briefing videos. But federal statute was in place at the time that this occurred the Federal Records Act being that statute. Now we have the opinion of both the Inspector General in this building and the National Archives and Records Administration that indeed these videos are covered under the Federal Records Act. Mm -hmm. So you would agree that at the time that this censorship took place, or shall we say more neutrally, the editing, yeah. uh, there was in place a federal statute that made it a crime to tamper with federal records and that these briefings were covered under that definition. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to judge if this happened retroactively. What I will say is that what we know now is that we need to set a disposition schedule. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, we're going to put that in place. Okay. Going forward, then, tampering with one of these briefing videos would, in fact, be a crime, correct? Well, what I would say is, and, and I also don't want to establish what a crime is, what I will say is that we will set a disposition schedule. We'll see if it will be temporary or permanent. We will set in place guidelines that formalize this, but that's also already been done in terms of our own policies now within public affairs. You know, Assistant Secretary Kirby has been very clear, and that guidance came down very early as soon as this was brought to our attention. So going forward under the rules that Assistant Secretary Kirby uh, has put in place, tampering with one of these briefing videos uh, will be a violation of State Department procedures. Yes. And you have no view at all as to whether that would also constitute a crime? At this stage, no. Do you know why there was never any disposition schedule for I don't, this kind no. of thing? Was it just an oversight? I think, uh, you know, what I, mean, I would say. The video of the briefings, is, it, 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 it postdates my, I mean, predates, what, what, predates sorry. <laughs> Thanks. It, no, it actually doesn't predate me because there, there was no video when I started covering this building. Uh, and You're certainly not yourself. one, yeah, Are certainly not one that was going up online. I thought it started under Carter. George Gaddis was the president under Not that didn't get, didn't go up on the website. Let me know when you guys want me to chime anyway. in. <laughs> anyway, and, 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 anyway, so it, it was a relatively yeah, recent phenomenon is. that these briefing videos have been put up online and even streamed live. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just curious, is that, did, did this just not cross anybody's mind? And, you know, and I, how can't, could I can't speak to that. I, I think probably, and, and again, you know, focusing really on James' question, we are going to fix this. Well, we I are going to do this. But, but the, but the transcript. James Rosen. In the era of James Rosen. You know, videos in which are. In all of you are cursed to live. <laughs> <laughs> in the era I mean, of James Rosen, where video. Trans, uh, and not just him, but of all his television colleagues, nice. which w w who rely on the, mm -hmm. on the video from the briefings, one would think that it would be pretty, uh, you know, big oversight to not set you know, a I, rule I, or a disposition schedule. I would say a couple schedule. things on this is one, you know, and and when when this came down, you know, the first thing I'll, I'll be honest when we heard from James about this is we checked the transcript because for us the transcript was the official record. You know, as, as we said at the time and as we have belabored at this podium, the transcript was always intact. You know, whether or not our rules kept pace with the technology living in the age of James Rosen, um, it appears like they didn't. You know, so, so now we're focused on that. We're going to put the rules in place. Kirby has put the policy in place, and we're going to live up to it. Soon you will graduate. It will be the era. <laughs> I think we're living in the Matt Lee, <laughs> Arshad Mohammed era myself. Uh, <laughs> switching over to the Clinton emails, yep. uh, presumably you are aware of uh, reports of a particular email in which Huma Abedin <clears throat> appears to have acknowledged that she left classified papers, indeed what she described as burn stuff, uh, in the pocket of a seat in a car, uh, and then was reduced to asking another colleague uh, to remove those papers from that location in Ms. Abedin's absence from the car and to store them in the trunk of that car. Mm. Um, did this 
conduct comport with State Department rules for the handling of classified information? Okay, so I've, I've read the article that you're referencing. I've also read the emails. Now, I'm, I'm loath to get into talking about specific emails, um, but I will say this is the premise of the article is incorrect. Um, we were, the, the email specifically references um, materials in a burn bag. Um, and the story alleges that burn bags, which I think you're all familiar with, they're brown bags with stripes on it, can only be used for the disposal of classified information. It's not the case. Um, I use burn bags in my office for unclassified information all the Sorry, time. Um, no. Um, as the regulations state, you know, sensitive but unclassified, what you guys would hear is SBU, are personally identifiable information. PII documents are often burned. Um, it's not accurate to say that um, any document going to a burn bag is a document that's classified. That seems classified. to be an extraneous point to the overall thrust of the article, which I wish you would address, which is whether or not uh, the conduct revealed in these emails met the standards for the handling of classified information. No, you're assuming that the information in there is classified, and that's not what the email exchange shows, James. Do you well, happen to know whether there was classified information at stake in this episode? I think you're making you're making a leap. Assuming I'm not now. I'm not making any leaps. I'm asking you: Do you happen to know whether there was any classified information at stake in this episode? I will say that the individuals um, who were involved in this are very aware of how to treat classified information. Burn bags are routinely used for SBU and PII information. If the information contained. Um, in the back seat of this car was so innocuous, why was Ms. Abedin so uh, urgently concerned with putting it in a trunk? Well, I would say probably, you know, and, and again, you know what, I don't want to get to in, because now, because now I'm answering hypotheticals and I shouldn't do I, that. I didn't, you're not answering, you know? you're, a, you're answering questions about established sets of facts, not a hypothetical at all. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not aware of the facts, I'm not aware of what went through this individual's mind, but I will dispute the fact that burn bags are only for classified info, because it's just not true. Final question, to sure. your knowledge, was diplomatic security ever alerted to this episode? I have no information on that at or all. Or was diplomatic security standing outside of the car in question? It's my understanding it was a motorcade Delhi. so yes, correct. So, and the car in question was in fact the car that Secretary Clinton would ride in? I'm not correct? sure, but it was part of a motorcade. So it was secure? It was part of a, a motorcade. It was part of the package? Yes, sir. So, in other words, it was protected by diplomatic security. Yes. In fact, it was an ambassador who was expected to be riding that vehicle and from whom Ms. Abedin sought to shield that material. Am I correct about that? I could absolutely not answer that. I have absolutely no information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, are we done with um, former Secretary Clinton's emails? Yep, we, I would be more I than happy of, to. Thank you, exactly. It's a lot easier. Anyway, so uh, let me ask you a very quick question. The Israelis stopped a, a Palestinian children group, it's called the Palestine Sings Children Chorus, as part of the UNICEF, from going to a, an, an, an event that they were invited to. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah. So I've, I've seen those reports from leaving Gaza. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'd refer you, of course, to the Israelis for more information. You know, generally speaking, and, and we've been clear on this, we're very concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. We've spoken before about freedom of movement. I understand, but don't you have a position on, you know, the the fact that these kids, you know, who have been sanctioned and aided and, and helped by UNICEF, they want to go and sing about peace and love and things of that nature. Are you not, you know, are you not upset? Are you not you know, um, uh, outraged, so to speak? Would you bring this up to the Israelis and say, why are you holding these kids? I mean, I'm not going to speak to this specific incident, but what I would say, which we've said multiple times, Saeed, is that we remain in close contact with the Israelis on our concerns on a range of issues that do include freedom of movement. Would you urge them to, to allow them to go through and participate? You know, not the knowing the specifics of that, I've seen the same reports you have. I just mm -hmm. really can't speak in any detail. Okay. Let me do, uh, also ask you on, on the advisory that you uh, released yesterday. The travel warning. The travel warning. Yeah. Uh, because it was very strong uh, in language. I know uh, that uh, it was it was replacing or it took place. Yeah. The it was a routine that you update. Said last uh, December, but why? The timing, because it seems that uh, 
you know, you're calling on, on Americans to leave Gaza. I think they are unable to follow This was a routine yeah. update. It very closely mirrors what we've said in previous travel warnings as well. Yeah. Um, for people who aren't aware, we did do issue a travel warning last night for Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. So this is part of our ongoing um, requirement to inform U.S. citizens for travel and people also who live there. And it was a routine update. Okay. All right. Can we take the travel warning? Sure. Uh, do you have any intention of updating your travel advice for France in the light of the uh, the bans on wearing a bikini or, uh, in some cases, hijab uh, on the beaches of the Côte d'Azur, would Muslim, would Muslim Americans be well advised to avoid holidays in south of France? Okay, so a few things on this. We understand these are local ordinances, so I would refer you to the French authorities on this. I also understand that the French highest court will actually address this issue, I believe, tomorrow. Um, you know, U.S. citizens um, are advised to comply with local law regardless of, of what country they visit. But on this particular very local ordinance, I, I would refer you to the French. So it's only if it becomes a nationwide a, a, a federal, a federal, um, uh, a federal law that you will take No, in. you know, we, we constantly place, look uh, at, at specific you know, we constantly look at the conditions for every country. We understand that this is, as I mentioned, going to be brought before the, the French court. Um, tomorrow on this, you know, U.S. citizens are required to comply with local law. However, we've also been very clear, you know, where we believe on freedom of religion, freedom to express your religious views. Um, on this, you know, in terms of how the French see these very specific local ordinances, I would have them speak. No, to no, I, I understand. I, I get it. It's just that you have taken positions on national laws, like in Turkey on the head scars, on in France mm -hmm. on the head scars. Is that the, the the bar for you to, if it's just a local ordinance? Well, we we understand, I think it's three local, local yeah. communities, it's, and it's being addressed now at a national level. Right, but so is if, it 30? but so if the, if the Supreme Court or whatever, whoever it is is looking at it comes back and says, you know what, not only is it okay for these three, mm -hmm. or the, the government is free to go ahead and do, make this nationwide, is that, that does then it rise to the level of something that you would, comment on? Well, no, as I mentioned, you know, we, as we've said multiple times from this podium, you know, of course we believe in the ability of people to express their religious views as they see fit, and we believe that in this case as well. Well, but they can't do that if they go to a beach in one of these three towns. So it, it is, it's, it's a tension, because U.S. citizens, we do advise them to obey local laws. So, so while we do so, as the local law says that you have to hop up and down on one foot instead of walking, then you, you tell know, them, and, you and think that's, that that's a reasonable thing to do. You know, well, we would certainly inform U.S. citizens of that issue. So that is so a that, hypothetical. So, the, so there's, a, so there's. A, <laughs> Thank you, James. So there's the there's. And you know, it is, and are we you, continue are, to are look. Are you going to? Are you going to update continue? your? I can't speak specifically to this. We understand that this is an ongoing discussion in France um, on this, but of course, as Anywhere in the world, we would continue to look at local conditions, and we update our country-specific information accordingly. Are you aware if any U.S. officials, either from the embassy or from the Office of Religious Freedom, have had conversations with their French counterparts to clarify this? I am not, Dave. Let me ask you this. Okay. Yep. Would you uh, issue an advisory to, let's say, women who observe this kind of thing, would like to that go to the beaches in France and so on from not going? Would you tell them not to go? You know, I think this is what we were talking about, too. So it's, it's we advise U.S. citizens, regardless of where they are in the world, to um, understand that they are subject to local laws. At the same time, we understand um, that this is an ongoing discussion in France. It's going to the high court there. As conditions, and the third part of that, which is Matt's question on our travel warnings, travel alerts, and country-specific information. As information change, without speaking directly to this, we do adjust the information we provide to U.S. citizens. John. I had a couple more questions. Let's get in. Let's right. go back. Um, just uh, President Biden on his trip said that. Uh, Vice President Biden. Vice President Biden, right. Uh, the, he advised. Uh, or urged Kurds not to cross the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that the official U.S. position? So we actually spoke about this earlier, so I'd refer you to the transcript. Okay, just one more question. Is yeah. Um, how do you expect the 
the Kurds to follow this after fighting for weeks uh, to liberate Manbij? We, we actually, we, we spent a good part of the early part of the briefing on this. Okay. So, do we have more? Please, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on the North Korean SLBM test, uh, this has been uh, categorized by various experts as the most successful to date. Uh, does, is the U.S. going to be taking any actions differently from responding to the previous uh, two of the same kind? Yeah, test? so I, I wouldn't speak to intelligence matters in terms of, you know, the success or the failure of this particular test. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'd reiterate, which is what we said at the top of the briefing, is that we'll continue to work at the U.N. as well as through other international fora as well as with our partners to um, address. Sure. Are we doing – it's okay. Go ahead, Matt. All right. Please see Last one. Uh, just I'm, I, I want to revisit the question that I've asked a couple times, and that is just to make sure because things keep kind of changing as new stuff comes out. But in light of recent reporting on the relationship or the, the ties between the Secretary Clinton's State Department and the Clinton Foundation, is mm -hmm. it still the Department's contention or determination that there was no conflict of interest, that, there was, that everything that was going on was appropriate and above board and followed the rules? The Department's actions under Secretary Clinton were taken to advance administration policy as set by the President and in the interests of American foreign policy. The State Department is not aware of any policy decisions influenced by donations to the Clinton Foundation. I, I, okay. No, not policy decisions. This the latest reporting yeah. is about, you know, access and meetings. Is it also the case that you've determined or that you're not aware of any um, preferential treatment given to um, donors. No, as, as you know, as, as we've spoken to, and, and you know, and I'm sorry to belabor this, is, is you, that, No, I asked the question. Yeah, and I'm is, asking is, the question because more and more keeps coming yeah. out. It, you know, as we've said previously, State Department officials are in range with a range of outside experts, individuals, organizations, nonprofits, foundations, academics. This is normal. This is, this is part of how the, uh, the State Department gathers information and informs um, our thoughts, um, pro and con, on any particular issue. Yes, one more on this. I think the word that was previously used was impropriety and that you were not aware of any impropriety. Is, can you stick with that? Yeah. Thank you. Well, when the challenges of the Secretary of State revealed that more than half of the people outside the government who were uh, lucky enough to secure a face-to-face -face audience or a telephone conversation with her were, in fact, through one means or another, donors to her family foundation, doesn't that raise some legitimate questions about whether preferential treatment was, in fact, being given to those donors? Yeah. I would dispute the idea of preferential treatment. I think you're referring to the AP article. And though Matt has shown himself as being perhaps the only person in the briefing room who can do complicated math, um, <laughs> I won't. I won't unpack uh, the math numbers on that. Um, I do know that AP said that they did not take into account Secretary Clinton's meetings with foreign leaders and diplomats, as well as U.S. government officials, to arrive at their calculations. You know, as we've said before, the State Department meets with a range of people, um, and a wide range of people outside individuals and organizations contact the State Department. Meeting requests, recommendations, proposals come to the department through a range of channels. You know, we can we can go on, but I think I answered that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys.